Hey everybody, Final Thoughts time for Hitabu, which is a run-through courtesy of one of my Kickstarter backers who on Kickstarter goes by the username Go For It. Go For It. I've never seen you actually use your real name, so I'm not sure if I should announce that. So I'll just say Go For It. I went for it. Hopefully you enjoyed um, this run-through after Jan and I have played it. And what did we think? Well, it's neat. There's a lot of really clever ideas. I so love this central idea of this work replacement dial that's constantly rotating from the good to the bad where, oh, do you do a work replacement action while it's really risky? Or do you wait for it to come out into the bright, sunny, shiny day where you don't have to risk anything, but maybe that means you have to wait a long time and by that, the, by that time the opportunity has passed? That's really a really, really, really cool system. I love it a lot. Um, and, you know, even though I guess substantially this is sort of a pickup and deliver game, I think, you know, just the raw mechanisms of, you know, buying stuff in, you know, the big city of Haitabu and then having to hire somebody to transport it out to your trading goods where you can then fulfill your contracts. That's a really nice one, two, three. It's you know an overall um, process that I think works very nicely, is all very nicely thematic and intuitive. Uh, it works. The market works. I have to say, I actually really enjoy the fact that the market has some volatility and variability, even in a two-player game, because of the way that you know markets tend to normalize over time, but they you know, it restocks with a little bit of randomness. I think that works really nicely. There's a lot of stuff I really like, but unfortunately, Unfortunately, in the end, this does not come together for me and Jen very well because, not because of the, de the design system, but because of the decisions that went into what it's doing. The fact that choosing to do a, a risky move is almost more of a risk not for me as the person doing it, but for everybody else around the table. It just, ah, you know, it. it, it well, it's just something that Jen and I did not care for. Um, you know, the fact that every time I try to visit there, you know, you pay the two bucks. And because you're doing that, you are making the conscious decision to say, right, okay, well, hey, oh, look, I rolled a three and a six. Well, I could choose the three, which means nobody gets hurt, or I can choose the six, which means you get screwed, royally screwed. And as you just saw in this run through, Jen just got screwed over and over and over again. And eventually, when she decided, well, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight back, she herself got screwed. And it's a cool system, don't get me wrong, and I, you know, I think it's very clever, but me and Jen, it is way, way, way too mean, and I so wish that the construct, you know, the, the, the pros and cons of, you know, taking the risk only affected the player taking the risk. That they were, you know, of these six things, they were all just six bad things. You know, I mean, no, two things that were like, okay, well, you, I mean, one, you get off completely scot-free. Um, you know, two, which are kind of bad, and then three, that which are awful. You know, something like that. Then, I think it'd be, re or, you know, two that are off scot-free, two that are minor, and two that are major. I would still think it would be an interesting, tough, tense decision to decide, do I wait for that action to come around to the light, or do I do it now and take the risk of something bad happening to me, but the, the fact of the way, the, the, there's a 33% chance that everybody around the table just gets really hit hard. And there's nothing wrong with that. And it's interesting, if you take away the concept that the bad thing that's happening to me was initiated by somebody else. And you say, you know, if the bad thing was initiated by some kind of event card that got drawn and it hit everybody, well, we wouldn't mind. We don't mind getting hit and smacked around by a game and having to deal with, uh, you know, uh, you know, unforeseen circumstances, that's perfectly fine. We enjoy that in lots of games where, you know, every round you have to draw an event and there's a flood or whatever it might be. But in this game, where it does come about because of the initiative of one player who, you know, 50% of the time should just be getting nailed to the wall. But, you know, the, the way luck goes, you could go the entire game, never once suffer a bad thing, and everybody else suffers instead of you if you're willing to pay a little bit extra. And that money is definitely money well spent. Or if you have the seer and you don't even have to pay. It's a really cool system, and I think this would be a game that Jen and I would probably, you know, like to love. A low to a high eight for us if the effects of taking the risk only affected the player taking the risk. But the fact that it affects everybody at the table um, just doesn't sit well with us, and we didn't enjoy it for that reason. And in fact, I know that the game, you know, it has gotten a lot of people who feel the same way just because, well, I don't know. 
For us, we don't mind the introduction of the randomness. The fact that, oh, I was planning on doing something, but then some random event happened to take away my cart, and now i got to you know, come up with a different plan. Don't have a problem with that. Have a problem, or you know, or we lost the money, or we lost a point, or whatever. That's fine. Have a problem with the fact that it's another player initiating it. And um, you know, and when I go over to darkness, I don't even want these bad things to happen. I just want to get done what I want to get done, and I want to avoid something bad happening to me. I don't want Jen to get screwed because of a choice I made. That feels awful every time it happens. Even though this was a virtual fake game I just played, it felt awful to make it happen now. And so, it's not a good fit for me and Jen. But for players who actually like Scrooge, and I know there are a lot of Euro fans out there who like uh, trading in the Mediterranean or this time and trading in the North Baltic Sea, but they do like to have an opportunity to screw their opponent every chance they get, I can see this being actually a lot of fun for that type of player. Because you go over there, and for you, it's less about, oh, I, you know, yeah, I'm running a risk of getting hurt myself, but mostly I'm doing this because I want everybody else around the table to get screwed. And everybody else, when they see me do it, they're like, oh, don't let him roll a six or a one. Anything but Oh, come on! Ah! Well, okay, I knew that was going to happen because everybody around the table is constantly looking to screw each other, so I'm always keeping a little, an extra good off to the side that I don't really care about just so that I can afford to lose it when somebody makes me lose it in unrest or whatever. I can see if you like interesting, fun, market manipulation, buy low, sell high games, and you like screwing over your opponents, this could be a good fit for you. Um, because that's what it delivers. It's definitely not a good fit for me and Jen. I will say one other thing that as a two-player experience, I, it's kind of a bummer. I think it's, I again, I already said, I love the notion that the market has some additional volatility built in because, you know, in a two-player game, in, with more players, this market would be going crazy. With two players, it just doesn't go very crazy. So I appreciate the fact that, you know, hey, they put in these things so that things will still move a bit. But what I and I don't quite understand why the designers did this. No matter what the player count, there is always the same number of cubes at the beginning of the game in the six markets. And I don't quite understand that. It really feels like at a two-player count, there should be only half as many cubes. Because there's a lot of really cool stuff to be had. There are bonuses to be had for completely wiping out a market, completely emptying it, or refilling a market that has been previously wiped out. And in a two-player game, that stuff is not very likely to happen because the market is still stocked up for a full four players. And I don't quite get why was the market content not scaled for fewer players. Obviously, it'd be something it'd be easy to do. Just literally cut, cut it in third, or you know, cut a 30% off or cut 50% off if you're playing a three or a two-player game instead of a four-player game. But I assume the designers had a reason for leaving it like that. Uh, another thing, actually, it's interesting. Spielworks has um, you know, been known for some very difficult to read rules over the years. These rules actually on the whole I think were very good. They show a really nice step forward in Spielworks being able to put together nice, easy to digest rules. In part because the game is really simple and elegant and clean. It's a simple worker placement game with this really cool wheel system. But one thing that really bugged me was the nomenclature they used. And I'd be willing to bet in the original German it's much smarter. But to call what is thematically is a season, to call that a turn means you don't really know what turn means. A turn is when I put a worker on here. I just took a turn. No, in this game, a turn is when all players have taken three actions. And, you know, and that really throws us for a loop because they keep using the word turn on all these cards and like, right, I just took a turn. Do I get to do this now? No, 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 no. You took, no, you took an action. When all players take an action, that's one phase. When three phases have been done, that's a turn. And it's like, wow, you had... The whole thing is very thematically grounded. There are seasons. Four seasons make a year. Each season is divided into three months. If all the nomenclature had referred to months, seasons, and years, it would have been super duper easy to understand. So that just kind of bugs me. You know, the whole... I was trained in the University of Washington as a, as a technical writer, and so that's just such a missed opportunity to make everything that much clearer. It's a minor complaint because, of course, after you played a few rounds, you get into the hang of it. You understand, no, turn does not mean turn. Turn means, I don't know what you'd call it. Turn means season, and you get, you get into the hang of it. So, I mean, I'm sounding like I'm really bagging on the game, but I do think it's really clever. And again, this central worker placement mechanism is just brilliant. In a different game, or in a game that wasn't quite so bloodthirsty, I think Jen and I would have enjoyed it a lot. And you know, and the and the raw mechanisms, the pick up and deliver without the actual transportation in between, which is always the worst part of pick up and deliver. That's really nice. A lot of really good stuff. And if you're looking for a bloodthirsty, dry euro, Hitabu might be the game for you. And that's it, folks.
Thanks for watching. Now, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, as always, please let me know. Apologies for any mistakes I made. Oh my gosh, I did way too much math there. I'm sure I really embarrassed myself, and I probably forgot to turn the wheel a few times, and a few other things here and there. But hopefully, you now have a pretty good idea of what this game feels like to play, and decide whether it's right for you and yours. So, thanks for watching, everybody. Talk to you later. So long. Bye-bye.